we are really just inundated with is various teachings on uh, what is often referred to as Calvinism. But a lot of people don't know and don't understand what Calvinism is. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. And probably over the next few Sunday mornings, we're going to talk about the idea, the subject of Calvinism. Calvinism is named after an individual named John Calvin. He was a 16th century reformer, uh, a theologian, who was heavily involved in the Protestant Reformation. He was influenced by a writer from the 5th century named Augustine. And he is noted, although the acronym TULIP wasn't something directly come up by him, uh, but it is something that is noted as uh, at least being attributed to him in, in various forms. Uh, but John Calvin was a co-founder of the Presbyterian denomination. And, and when it comes to his teachings, when it comes to the idea of what is referred to as the tulip, what you will find is the majority of denominations today follow, uh, in part, if not most of, all of these teachings. So when we talk about Calvinism, for basically what we're talking about is the idea of the tulip. So what is it? What is the tulip? The tulip stands for this. The T is total hereditary depravity. That is the idea that a child is born into this world a sinner, inheriting not only Adam's sin, but, but a corrupt nature. He cannot do anything good, anything right, even if he wanted to. U stands for unconditional election. It's the idea of a predestination. God has determined who's saved and who's lost. Uh, and he's already made that determination before the foundation of the world. Limited atonement. The idea that God or Christ only died for a select few. That Christ died for the elect, whom God has predetermined is saved and not for those whom God has predetermined is lost. Irresistible grace. Those who God has determined to be saved, whether they want to be or not, it doesn't matter. They cannot resist God's grace uh, when it comes upon them. And perseverance of the saints, also known as once saved, always saved. That those who are children of God cannot lose their salvation regardless of what sin they commit, regardless of what it is they engage in, ungodliness, uh, uh, sinful activities. It doesn't matter. Uh, they cannot so sin as to lose their salvation. That is the five tenets of Calvinism. And this is the, the, the basis, the foundation not only of the Presbyterian denomination, but the Reformed Baptist and several other denominations as well. And so we're going to examine over the next couple of weeks just exactly what it is that, that uh, is taught. Look at a little bit closer this idea, for example, today. Total hereditary depravity. What, what does that mean? And we'll just give a brief definition. And what does the Bible say about it? So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So as we think about total hereditary depravity, this is the idea, again, that a child is born in sin with a corrupt nature and cannot or is unable to do anything good. As a matter of fact, when you talk to those who are very uh, steeped into Calvinism about this particular doctrine, this particular idea, you know, and what it is they truly believe, because you think about a, a child who does something good, that does something that, that 
would be counted as a, a good deed, something that has helped the community. And you ask them about that. Here is someone who's done something good. Their explanation of that is, well, they, they may have an appearance of being good. However, they had ill motives. Their motives were evil because of their corrupt nature. They can't do anything good. And if it appears to be good, then it must be with the wrong motives. That's the foundation, foundational point. And every one of these points build upon one another. And as one falls, they will all fall. But nevertheless, as we look at this one, one thing at a time, think about that very concept, that idea that a child not only is corrupt, a child, an infant is evil, but they couldn't do anything good even if they wanted to do something good. And what appears to be good is with ill motives. It, it, that's how far they, they go with this teaching. Well, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible tell us when it comes to our nature? When it comes to, uh, when it comes to how we are created? When it comes to uh, what God not only expects of us, but what we can and what we cannot do? You know, beginning in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and if, if you're taking notes, you can write these passages down. I would encourage you to do that and go back and read them later uh, and really look at what is being said. But Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 29, there we are told that God made man upright. God made man upright. But notice who it is, he says, that has sought out many schemes. Man. Man has sought out many schemes, a decision, a choice that they have made. Not that God made them, not that that's the, the, the how, uh, what was, uh, what, uh, like they don't have any choice. But he says there that God made man upright. This isn't God's fault. It, it isn't that God had made man to go out and, and uh, go after evil schemes or come up with evil schemes. But God made man upright, but man himself has sought out many schemes. You know, when you read the Old Testament, as you go to Psalm chapter 106, verse 38, Psalm 106, verse 38, one of the things that we read several times, really, throughout the Old Testament is some of the practices that the children of Israel engaged in, one of which was offering their children. Jeremiah chapter 7, for example, says that they were offering their children to the god Molech. They would take their, their infants, their, their small ones, and they would go to a, this idol that had been created like this furnace. And the god, with an open mouth and arms stretched out, they would lay that child across the arms of that idol, and they would stoke the fire so it would become so hot that the heat and the flame would, would stretch out through the mouth and consume or, or burn up that child. And they did so as offerings to pagan gods. Even the children of Israel were engaged in doing that very thing. And the psalmist says that they it, it gets on to them for doing that as well as they were offering their children even in the land of Canaan. But notice what he says about their children in Psalm 106, verse 38. It says there that when they were offering their children to those idol gods, that they were pouring out innocent blood. That doesn't sound like a child that is evil. That doesn't sound like a child that is that is plagued with sin, that has a, 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 a corrupt nature, God says that child is innocent, that the blood of that child it is innocent. They haven't done evil. They haven't done anything wrong. Well, it wasn't just in the Old Testament that that was talked about. In Matthew 19, in verse, uh, verse 14, Jesus himself said that children have a heavenly nature. A heavenly nature. It doesn't sound like a corrupt nature, but a heavenly nature. In 1 Corinthians, our scripture reading, and this is probably one of the more powerful passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 
If you notice what Paul, by inspiration of King Jesus, says in verse 20 about infants, the ESV renders it uh, there that we are not to be children in understanding, but being infants in evil. And he goes on to say that to be mature in our thinking. Don't be children in understanding, but be infants in evil and mature in our thinking. Now think about the idea of being infants in evil. How could Paul ever say or make such a statement if infants are born evil, if infants are born corrupt, if they are born separated from God because they can't do anything good, they can't do anything right, or they have ill motives when it does appear like something is good or right. Paul tells us that we are to be infants in evil. That doesn't sound like, you know, you know, God looks at children as being such corrupt and evil creatures. Why would we be told to be like them? I want you to be as infants are in evil, totally corrupt, totally depraved, and separated from God. That doesn't make sense. That's not what Paul or God is trying to convey in this particular text what he's really demonstrating to us is that children are innocent they're not born corrupt much like what Paul himself said concerning himself in Romans chapter 7 verse 9 in Romans chapter 7 verse 9 when Paul kind of compares the old law and the new law the old covenant and the new covenant he says you can't be under both and he, he kind of draws a comparison uh, between even, uh, even adultery. If you want to be a part of the new law and hold on to the old law, you're committing spiritual adultery. But he talks about himself as when he was a child. And he says that there was a time when I was alive without the law. That can only be a reference to when he was a child. That's the only thing that could possibly make sense in the context. He was alive without the law. That was prior to the knowledge of Christ, but, but also prior to his understanding of the old law as well, which is when he was a child. And he says, I was alive without the law. Not dead in sin, but alive. But then the death blow to Calvinism and the total hereditary depravity argument. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, there in verse 39, when you look at how children are described in Deuteronomy 1, verse 39, it's amazing how this could even be an argument, how, how we could even have this discussion and have so many people believing that children are born depraved of fellowship with God, that children are born evil and not being able to do anything good or right. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 39, in describing the children there, he says that they know neither good nor evil. I want you to think about that. Let that sink in for just a minute. The children here know neither good nor evil. Who's that sound like? Who's that remind you of? Think about Adam and Eve before they sinned. Remember, they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before they took of that tree, which God said not to partake of, they had no knowledge of good or evil. Before they sinned, that was their state. And now Moses, by inspiration of God, is writing, describing children as being in the same state of Adam and Eve before they sinned having no knowledge of good or evil. There's the state of children. There's the state of infants. When, when we are born, there, there it is. The, the Bible tells us that we are in that state, just as Adam and Eve, before they sinned. You know, that doesn't mean that we haven't experienced and we're not suffering from the consequences 
of Adam's sin, but we do not bear the guilt of their sin. We're not guilty of the sin of Adam. We're not inheriting the sin of Adam. That's not what the Bible teaches. Are we suffering the consequence? Surely, because they no longer have, and we no longer have access to the tree of life. Not that physical tree. However, we've been given access to the true spring of life, Christ Jesus. So we, yes, there are some consequences that even we endure today because of the sin of Adam and Eve, but we do not, uh, we, we are not guilty and we have not inherited their sin. In Matthew chapter 18, Verse 12, Jesus talking about the parable of the lost sheep. And the idea here is, is talking about sheep, sheep and saying that you know, they represent the people. They represent God's children. But notice what he says about the sheep. He didn't say that the sheep are born astray. He says the lost sheep go astray. Now, even though that sounds kind of simple, it's still a powerful point to, to, to show that they weren't born in sin, that God doesn't look at us as totally depraved as something that is separating him from birth. What separates us from God as we grow and come to that age of accountability is our sin, what we do, what we choose in our life. So do we inherit sin? I mean, does the Bible say anything about whether we do or whether we don't? Ezekiel 18, verse 20, tells us that the Son does not inherit the sins of the Father, nor the Father inherit the sins of the Son. We do not inherit sins from somebody else. That's what the Bible teaches. And yet, still today, not only have, uh, have man-made churches been established founded upon the idea that man is born inheriting sin, but people believe it. And they accept it in spite of what the Word of God reveals. And, and you know, they have certain proof texts. They have certain things that they teach, certain things, ideas that they have. Ephesians chapter 2, for example. Ephesians chapter 2 there in verse 3. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, he says there that we once, and to paraphrase, lived after the flesh. You know, we were involved in all of these things. You know, we, we were engaged in, in all of these sins, as he goes through the list. And then he says, and were by nature... Children of wrath. By nature, children of wrath. See, Calvinists go to this particular test and there it is. There's our proof text. There's what we believe. That we have this, this nature that we have inherited. That we can't do anything good. That we are born evil and separated from God. You know, there's one thing not in that particular text and that is the word inherited. It doesn't say that, that we are, by inherited nature, children of wrath. It says by nature. See, what proves too much proves nothing at all because we can go to a text like the book of Romans chapter 2, verse 14. In Romans 2, verse 14, it says that the Gentiles, by nature, did what the law required. Now, wait a minute. The Gentiles by nature did what the law required. And yet when Paul was writing there to, to the Ephesians, he said that by nature they were children of wrath. You know, what, what kind of nature are we talking about? Because it can't be an inherited nature because Calvinists believe that all are born depraved. You see, there's something that is referred to as an, an acquired nature. Nature and think about what Paul said there in Ephesians two. Here they they were by children uh, by nature children of wrath because of what they had done, what they had been doing. They had been involved in sin so much 
You know, much like today when we talk about learning a second language and being able to, to do things really without thinking about it, speaking fluently, uh, you know, either a second language or, or certain things that we, we do without thinking, uh, we call that second nature. It's a, an acquired thing. It's something that we've done over and over and over again to where we do it without thinking about it. That's the point Paul's making in Ephesians chapter 2. They were so involved in sin, they didn't even think about whether or not it was wrong or whether or not it was right. They didn't care. And so that's the nature that's under consideration. Just as in Romans with the Gentiles, they were taught certain things were right. And they were following certain things which just so happened to coincide with the law. And so by nature, they did what the law required. They, uh, they required. They acquired certain habits that were right in line with the law. It was an acquired nature, not an inherited nature. And so when it comes to just simply looking at and studying the scriptures, these things really begin to, to become clear. You know, are we pursuing sin? Are, are we actively pursuing? That's where that nature really comes. Well, you know, think about this as well. If we are born in sin, if we are totally depraved as children of God, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, or 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, says that evil men grow worse and worse. How is that possible? How is it possible in 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, to grow worse and worse if we're already totally depraved? If we're already can't do anything good, can't think anything that is right, and if we do something that appears to be good, appears to be right, our motives are evil, if that's the situation that we are born into, how can we get any worse than that? And yet the Bible says that people are growing worse and worse. And then, of course, we can think, well, whose fault is it? If we're born that way, if God made us that way, we inherit that sin. Whose fault is it that we're not doing anything good, we're not doing anything right? Well, Calvinists have to blame God. It's God's fault. God's to blame. God is the reason why we're that way. Really? Do you believe that? I mean, you're taking away our choice altogether. And you, it's a slap in the face to even our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus didn't understand that. Jesus didn't think that way. In Mark 6, verse 6, Jesus marveled at the unbelief of those who were there. Now, why would he marvel at unbelief if it was impossible for them to believe? If it was impossible for them to understand or do anything right or good? Why would Jesus himself marvel at their unbelief if they couldn't believe? Because they were born totally depraved. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Why would we believe such a doctrine that contradicts one text after another? That rips out of context one passage after another? And finally, Adam's sin, was it forgiven? Was Adam forgiven of his sin? You know, I, I think most of us who are Bible students would come to the conclusion uh, and looking back that, that yes, yes he was. Even if it was after the sacrifice of Christ. And yet we still today are going to inherit a sin that has already been forgiven. You know, God says about something about unforgiven sin. It says he'll remember them no more. And really putting to our account, not only a sin that we didn't commit, a sin that we had nothing to do with, but a sin that's already been forgiven. And now we are guilty of the same without doing anything. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up with the word of God. But what God does tell us, 
what God does tell us is that we are to be as infants in evil. Because infants are innocent. Infants are pure. Infants are good and right. They are made upright by God himself. And as they grow, and they may come short, they, they, they sin. They separate themselves because of God, but because of sin, they separate themselves from God. But think about the reason they're separated from God is because of their sin, not someone else's. Because of what they have done. And because of what we do as we grow, because of what we do, God has made provisions that we can have our sins forgiven through the blood of Christ. We can be forgiven of what we have done. Because on that day of judgment, we'll stand before the judgment seat, give an account, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, giving an account for all that we have done. Not what we have inherited, but what we have done. That's what makes sense. That's what the Bible teaches. And we would encourage all who, who hear the gospel, not only to believe and to understand that, that God hasn't made us corrupt. God hasn't, hasn't caused us to be guilty of a sin we didn't commit, but stands ready to forgive us of the sins we have forgiven. If we will turn to him, if we will have our sins forgiven, our sins washed away by the blood of Christ through our humble obedience. Believing Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we can repent of our sins, confess our faith, and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And the blood of Christ will wash away our sins and God will remember them no more. Amen. What a wonderful blessing it is. To know that God stands ready to do that very thing. That Christ came and died for each and every one of us. That when our children are born, they are innocent. They are pure. They, they don't need to be sprinkled over. They don't need to, they don't need to have uh, anybody uh, do some kind of, uh, of voodoo or anything else to try and get rid of some type of inherited sin. They are born pure and innocent. We were born pure and innocent. But as we've grown, we know we've sinned. And God says, come back to me. Because the lost sheep have gone astray. But come back to me. Come back to me, he says. Will you come back to him in your obedience? If not, why not? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you come to him who is offering you eternal life in the glories of heaven? Why wouldn't you come to him who is offering you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? Why wouldn't you come to him in humble obedience? If you're here this morning and you haven't obeyed the gospel, you haven't put on Christ in the water of your baptism, we would plead with you not to delay, not to wait, but, but take care of that. Even today, even this morning, make sure your life is on track with God. Die to sin in repentance. Be buried with him in, in the watery grave of baptism just as Christ died and was buried and rise up from that watery grave to walk in a newness of life.